Years ago, I came across a verse of scripture in Isaiah by listening to a tape on history. And in this tape, it said that government was structured in America according to Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. And Isaiah 33, verse 22 says, The Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, it is he who will save us. And this message talked about how the founding fathers of America believed that man is sinful, we're fallen, and we don't always choose to go the right direction. We fall short of God's glory. And so, no one man on earth should be a king, the lawgiver, and the judge. Rather, the most effective kind of human government is when there is a king, a president, an executive leader, and then there are lawgivers, a congress or a parliament, and then there are judges who interpret the constitution of a country as it applies to the issues that come. And as I thought about that, I thought, really, that's how God's designed the church, because there is an executive leader of the local church. We usually call him in America the pastor, the lead pastor, the senior pastor. 1 Timothy 3, 1 calls him the overseer. And then there's also a plurality of leaders, often called elders. Some churches call them deacons, deaconesses. And so there is a law-giving group in the church, if you will, um, that middle section. And then there is the membership of the church who make the final decisions of the interpretation of Scripture and the interpretation of a church constitution. And so I believe God has designed that healthy churches would have shared power different roles and responsibilities that complement one another, all under the Lord Jesus Christ, who is indeed our king, our lawgiver, and our judge. And only he can be all three at once. And actually this verse in Isaiah points to the millennial kingdom when Christ will indeed be this for us for a thousand years. And we'll have perfect governance. But until then, a distribution of responsibilities is helpful. Well, our session right now is going to focus on the roles and responsibilities of that middle section. Sometimes it's called a church board. Sometimes it's called a deacon board. Sometimes it's called an elder board. Sometimes it's deacons and elders and deaconesses all serving together as one law-giving group within the church. There are different terms. But as I've studied Scripture, there's only one scene in Scripture where we see, in a sense, this governing group working to help God's people to govern in a good way. There's descriptions of the qualifications, but only one picture of them working. And that's in Acts chapter 6. And so I'm going to read Acts chapter 6. Uh, the first few verses, and uh, we're going to be applying this passage of Scripture to how, indeed, church boards can be effective and efficient in what we're called to do. So, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Aramaic-speaking community, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And so the twelve, 
gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are full, known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And this proposal pleased the whole group and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and also Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now we have to remember that the book of Acts is descriptive and not prescriptive. It doesn't tell us exactly how to do things, but it describes oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes good ways of doing things. And I believe that indeed there are some timeless truths here in Acts chapter 6 on how governing boards can be the most effective in serving the church of Jesus Christ. First, we see here that effective boards pray. For the apostles said, we will turn this responsibility over to the seven and we will give attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. You know, if a church board doesn't guide along with the pastor, the ministry of prayer in a church, who's going to do it? And so it's very important that a board pray together. Indeed, sometimes there's an hour of prayer before business is decided in an effective board meeting. I've seen it where churches sometimes spend a Saturday morning talking about the different things going on in their lives, praying for one another, and no business is done. That's held for another time of the month. I've also seen where churches pray on Wednesday nights. They have a prayer meeting every week. I've also seen where churches pray either before or after the worship service on Sunday. But somehow it is the church board that needs to lead the congregation into the ministry of prayer, however it's done. So we have to ask the question, how is our board guiding the ministry of prayer in our church? The next issue that boards have to address and is that effective boards have to guide a process. You'll notice that when this problem with the widows arose, the apostles, as the governing group of the church, gathered everybody together. This was thousands of people. We complain about a congregational meeting with a couple hundred people. This is thousands of people gathered together to address together this problem with the widows. And the apostles didn't just decide this in a back room. They wanted to lead a process of discovering what God wanted in this ministry to the widows. And so boards have to be careful of overlooking things. That's not processing things. They need to be careful of just calling on the members of the board to handle the problem. Notice they didn't say, okay, Andrew, you live on this side of town. You handle the widows over there. Peter, you live over there. You handle the widows over there. Bart, you live over there. You handle the widows. No, they didn't do that. We tried that once in our church. We tried to divide the whole church up into groups of people that each elder or deacon would take responsibility for. It didn't work because this group needed to be giving governance to the whole thing not taking on the individual responsibilities that needed to go to like Sunday school teachers and small group leaders. So as we delegated this care for people in a healthy process that involved more than just us, it did work. Another problem with process is that you can just turn to the same old little group of friends the apostles could have just said, well, we know these two guys over here. They could probably do a good job running all these tables. No, they didn't do that. They guided a process to empower God's people to be involved. 
They weren't like this guy and this tribe. Somebody came up with uh, an idea and uh, they said, so does anybody else fear, here feel that their needs aren't being met? You go over the cliff. That's not a very good process. Effective elder boards then guide a process. They guide prayer in the church. And they also empower God's people for effective service. This word empower is a biblical word. When it's translated equip, it's the Greek word katotizo. And it has a number of meanings in the New Testament, literally. It means to mend the nets. It does not necessarily imply that they were damaged, though it does in some passage, passages. But the idea of equipping or empowering means to put in things in a right order or relationship. And so it's used for bringing opposing factions in a government together to empower them, to equip them. And it's also used in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, with the idea of framing, that God framed the world. God put the whole world into a right order and arrangement. And that's one of the responsibilities of elders is to make sure that people understand their gifts and they're put into the right place, that under people are respected in terms of their maturity and put into the right place, that ministries like to widows that could be overlooked or to young children in the nursery, that people are put into the right place so that the church functions well. This is all one of the functions of an effective board to empower. Effective boards also govern with proposals. Notice that the elders brought a proposal to the whole group that involved choosing seven men who would give the oversight to the care of the widows. Thankfully, they weren't like this guy. Here he is in a board meeting and he's got his little stick with a hammer on the top and he asked, does anybody else have a comment on my proposal? Thankfully, the elders didn't work that way. They were willing to work together in a unified way to bring a unified proposal to the church, and it brought unity in terms of the answer. Too often, boards are division, divided, and they bring something to the congregation to decide, but all it does is divide the church. Boards have to be very deliberate as a governing body, that before they bring a proposal to the people in a congregational meeting, they should be in agreement that this is a good proposal. We all can vote for this. We all can agree to this. We all believe this is the way to go. I've seen churches bring forward a person to be the next pastor. And the board was divided. The search committee was divided. They thought the church could decide it but it didn't decide anything. It just divided the church. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And so proposals can be multifaceted. In fact, this proposal re was for the widows and the care of the widows, there are other kinds of proposals that can be brought. There can be the proposal to move to small group ministry that a church can do. That's an S-curve change where a church is going one direction, but they need to change direction and go into a new direction with a new ministry, as you can see on the board here. This is sometimes called a pivot or an S-curve change. It might involve multiplying new small groups. It might involve a change of location. Perhaps a church is meeting in a room that's too small for them. And the S-curve change that they need to make is they need to change to a room that's bigger so that more people can come and not feel like they're crowding in. Because if a room has more than 20% of the chairs not filled, it looks too full and new people don't want to come in. The maximum number of People in filling the chairs in a church room should be about 80% of the chairs filled. 20 should be left for other people coming in. 
And if that can't be accommodated, then it's time to change locations. There's also an S-curve change or a pivot that can be made where there's a new unified direction on what we're going to do to reach new people in our community. One church I know decided that they were going to target young families with children. So they worked very hard to have a good nursery and a good children's church. And they invited through Facebook and through social media and advertisements in the paper and posters at the school that their church was a good home for a young family that wanted their church to grow up with a church experience. That was their S-curve change that resulted in years of continued growth because of a proposal that was unified by the board and unified as it was brought to the congregation. And everybody worked together in this new direction of reaching young families for Christ. A change of pastors can be an S-curve change. It can be a new proposal. Maybe it's time to add another pastor. Maybe it's time for a pastor to move on and do something else. And this kind of a change can be a significant turning event, a pivot into a new ministry. But again, the board must be unified as they make this recommendation to the congregation if there's any hope that the congregation will also agree to this as the congregation did in Acts chapter 6. And so effective elder boards will pray. They will guide a process. They will empower God's people. They will make proposals. And they will govern by policies. A policy is just simply any board decision or utterance. And in essence, a policy is when the board of the church says to a ministry, now you can do whatever you want within these parameters. They set a policy boundary. They say to the youth group, you can invite anybody in here you want, but we don't want alcohol in the building. That's a policy. They can say to um, a group who is going to use the building, you're welcome to come, you're welcome to participate, you're welcome to use our building, but we ask that our, our policy is, is that you pay for someone to clean the facility after you leave. That would be an example of a policy. And that's one of the things that boards have to do. They have to govern by good policies. They are to give the oversight. They're not to micromanage all the decisions that a pastor makes. They're not to micromanage all the decisions that are made on how to run the youth group. They're to set clear policies and then empower the leaders to do it the way they see best within those parameters and boundaries. 